There was a rake of three old coaches that had been on the Fat Controller's Railway long before Thomas came to the island. James, Edward and Henry took it in turns to pull these coaches as part of their suburban trains. James loved these coaches and would seek every chance he got to pull them, as he thought they went well with his smart red paint. One day at the sheds, James was in a foul temper. It's not fair, he huffed crossly. They have been on the railway for many years. Why do they have to be scrapped? What's being scrapped? Henry yawned from the other end of the shed. The old coaches, rapped James. The fat controller said that some fancy new ones were being brought over from the mainland. I saw them in the yard this morning, said Percy. They're really nice. James scoffed. I'm still going to take those old coaches out, he fumed. I wouldn't do that if I were you, James, Edward warned. The fat controller has placed them in the main siding at the big station. I will be taking them with my scrap train this afternoon. James was furious, but all he could do was mutter under his breath as he headed off to work. James pulled into the big station. Waiting for him at the platform was a beautiful rake of red coaches. Ugh, horrible things, he grumbled. He then noticed the old coaches sat in the siding. James looked at the new coaches for a few seconds, and then looked back at the old ones. I'm sure the passengers wouldn't mind one more outing with the old coaches, he said to himself. That afternoon, Edward arrived with a scrap train to take away the old coaches, but was very surprised to see that they weren't there waiting for him. That's odd, he thought. I was certain Percy said that he had shunted them here. At that moment, Thomas scampered up the line with Annie and Clarabel. Thomas, Edward called, have you seen the old coaches? Not since this morning, Thomas replied. Why? I was supposed to take them to the scrapyard, explained Edward. They were here, Thomas reassured, but the only engine that was here after me was... Before Thomas could even finish, Edward soon realised. I must find the fat controller, he fumed and hurried away, leaving a confused Thomas, Annie and Clarabel behind. Meanwhile, James had stopped at Edward's station with the old coaches. He was feeling very pleased with himself. These coaches won't be scrapped now, he chortled. Oh, won't they now, said a stern-sounding voice. James almost jumped when Edward arrived. The fat controller stepped down from his cab and walked sternly up to James. You have disobeyed my orders he said. These coaches have been retired, and that is why I brought new ones to the railway. Unless this is Sir James Hatt's railway, then these coaches would have a different fate. James felt rather defeated. At the fat controller's command, he shunted the coaches in the station siding, and Edward then took them back to the big station to join his scrap train. The passengers were cross that they couldn't go anywhere, but luckily the fat controller had sent Percy to bring the new coaches for James to pull for the rest of the day. At first, James didn't like the new coaches and felt rather silly, but as he puffed up Gordon's Hill, he had to admit that his smart red paint looked very stylish with their own. By the time James had reached the end of the line, he had had a change of attitude towards the new coaches. In truth, he was going to miss the old ones, but he knew that they had had a long and useful working life. And deep down, James hoped that these new coaches would serve the Fat Controller's Railway for many years to come.
If there was one engine who was proud to work on the Fat Controller's Railway, it was Oliver, the Great Western Engine. Ever since he was saved from scrap by Douglas, along with his brake van Toad, Oliver was more than delighted to have been given a new home and a second chance of working life. Oliver enjoyed working on Duck's branch line, but there were times when he didn't mind a good run to stretch his wheels as far as the big station or beyond. But there were times as well where Oliver would easily get annoyed with the tiniest things. There's a new film that was in the cinema last week, he said. Anyway, Percy continued, it was all about a railway that was closing down, or so driver says, of course, and two drunk men stole an engine and drove it on the road. Did you just say an engine drove on the road? In this film? he asked. Yes, replied Percy, but it was a very funny story from what Driver says. Percy, said Oliver sharply, nothing like that would ever happen on the Fat Controller's Railway. It's a film for a reason. You wouldn't catch me doing a reenactment of that silly little picture. Percy felt rather hurt, but said no more. That afternoon, Oliver took some empty trucks to the ballast yards, where he found Duck. Percy comes out with the silliest things these days, he complained. What's rattled your coupling today then, chuckled Duck. Oliver told Duck about the movie. Duck guffawed with laughter. I'm surprised at you, Oliver, he said. It's only a movie, it's nothing to get upset over. Yes, but something like that would never happen here, said Oliver firmly. Honestly, fancy getting carried away by two drunk men and being driven on the road. It's ridiculous. Duck just chuckled as Oliver marshaled his trucks to one of the ballast chutes. That evening, Oliver's mood had not improved. Percy usually took charge of the mail train, but tonight he had been called elsewhere. The fat controller entrusted Oliver to take the mail instead. As Oliver puffed along, he was still in a foul mood. He was too busy thinking about Percy and the film that he didn't notice a red signal. Earlier that day, George the steamroller had been working at an abandoned station, turning one part of the railway's loop into a road. George, of course, had been careless and had tarmacked it his own way. But George knew it wasn't the right way. Oliver went through the signal, and little did he know what was going to happen next. The next thing Oliver knew, he suddenly hit a stone in the middle of the road. He toppled over and landed into a nearby ditch. His crew jumped to safety, luckily landing on the railway line nearby. What the heck are you playing at? George shouted when he caught his breath. You steam engines shouldn't be on the roads. Well, if you'd fix that wretched crossing, Oliver shot back. That's enough, said Oliver's driver. We're going to have to leave you here and go for help. They returned soon. The breakdown services won't be here until morning, said Oliver's driver. George's driver politely offered Oliver's crew a ride home. Chortling at his own wit, George headed back to his yard, leaving a rather embarrassed Oliver in the ditch. The next morning, the breakdown crane arrived to rerail Oliver, but he wasn't pleased which engine was bringing the cranes to him. Percy had the slyest grin on his face when he saw Oliver being lifted out of the ditch and back onto the rails. He took Oliver back to the yards at Tidmouth for his crew to check him over. They were just finished when Thomas arrived with his morning run. Well, 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 Oliver, he remarked. That was quite the stunt you pulled last night, wasn't it? You know, Thomas, said Percy, 
Oliver here thinks that a scene from a silly movie would never happen on the Fat Controller's Railway. Quite right, chuckled Thomas. Hey, Oliver, there's going to be a film in the cinema next week set in a galaxy far, far away. I don't suppose you'll be given a spaceship makeover for that, will you? Oliver didn't say a word. He now thought the subject of movies and reenactments was the last thing he wanted to think about. Diesel was not in the best of moods. After he had played a trick on Fergus that he was no longer the pride of the cement works, the Fat Controller had caught him out and had sent Diesel to work at the smelters. Diesel hated every single moment of it. The Ironworks brothers, Ari and Bert, didn't make things easier for him. Diesel was pleased when his work at the smelters had come to an end. The Fat Controller immediately sent him back to the other railway in disgrace. But this time, when Diesel came back to the mainland, he did not get the usual homecoming he expected. When Diesel arrived, the mainland controller was waiting for him. He looked very stern and very cross. Uh, good, good morning, sir, Diesel stuttered. Save me the detail, the mainland controller interrupted. Diesel, I have finally had it. I am fed up of you being brought back here all the time as soon as you cause problems for Sir Topham's Railway. I can't keep it up anymore. Diesel, I am no longer going to keep you on my railway. You can find somewhere else to live as far as I'm concerned. With that, the mainland controller turned sharply on his heels and walked away. At first, Diesel didn't seem to care until the realization kicked in. Now he didn't have a home. Sodor didn't want him. The mainland didn't want him. Diesel didn't know what to do. If I go back to Sodor, they'll hate me, he whimpered. And if I stay here, they'll hate me even more. Instinct told him to go back to Sodor. He wasn't sure, he gave it a try. Diesel arrived at the fuel depot. He was feeling very lost and very sorry for himself. Just then, Mavis, the Diesel who worked at the quarry, came over. What are you doing here? she asked. I thought the Fat Controller sent you away. Diesel gulped. He was secretly pleased to see Mavis and told her everything. When he'd finished, Mavis's heart sank. Oh, Diesel, she said, I am sorry. Don't bother talking to the Fat Controller about it, said Diesel. I know now where I'm not wanted. Before Mavis could say anything else, Diesel rumbled away. She had to do something, otherwise Diesel wouldn't have a home to go to. Later that day, Mavis was at the quarry. Thomas was helping her as Bill and Ben had been called away elsewhere. Mavis was just telling Thomas what had gone on with Diesel when to her surprise the Fat Controller arrived. Mavis, Thomas, he boomed, I hear you've been doing very well at the quarry. I've just come to congratulate you on your hard work. Thank you, sir, said Thomas. Thank you, said Mavis. Sir, could I have a word? The Fat Controller listened. By the time Mavis had finished explaining about Diesel, the Fat Controller first looked concerned. I know I've sent Diesel away many times, he said, but seeing as now the mainland doesn't want him, it leaves me with no choice. What he said next made Thomas very shocked. But Mavis smiled. She knew that Diesel 
was going to have some good news finally come his way. A few days later, Mavis was resting in her shed at the quarry when a horn sounded. Diesel backed into the shed next to her. You're looking happier, said Mavis. The fat controller has made me a northwestern engine, Diesel beamed. I know, said Mavis. She gave a knowing smile. Diesel gasped. You did this for me? Of course I did, said Mavis. We're Diesels. We should look out for each other just as the steam engines do. Diesel felt very happy. Diesel is still a devious engine because he's that sort. And he does have moments when he's still mischievous and often causes trouble for the engines. But considering the fact that he was saved from the other railway and now a Northwestern engine, Diesel is secretly happy that he finally has a railway he can call home. He's really getting on my nerve. Thomas isn't even here anymore. He's gone to work on the branch line. Not Thomas. Marklin. Oh. Marklin's still here? I thought the fat controller sent him away ages ago. You'd be surprised. He kept complaining to me about his trains. It wasn't my fault. He seems to have a bad temper with everyone. What do you expect? He doesn't get to see the world like Thomas does. You're the reason why I fade into the background nowadays. He is an arrogant old brute. I just don't understand what his problem is towards me. Ever since I got my branch line, Marklin has treated me like scrap iron. Maybe something's troubling him. Troubling him? The big engines have said he's targeted them as well. It stops now, Percy. the fat controller's job. What's the fat controller gonna do about it? He never listens to me. You lot never listen to me either. We do listen to you. Not since that little blue runt came to the island. Don't you dare talk about Thomas that way. Now go off and hide in the corner, you little black rain cloud. Gordon, there was no need for that. The stupid little runt told me to go and fetch my own coaches and then spoke illly of Thomas. I won't stand for it. <laughs> Please don't be upset with him. It wasn't his fault. Why are you sticking up for me? Something's troubling you. Why don't you tell us what it is? I just miss my old railway. 
The fat controller said I was going to stay here for quite some time, but he wasn't specific on how long I'd be here. You miss your old friends, don't you? I miss them a lot. I'm... I'm really sorry. Don't be. I just want to go home. Poor engine. Luckily, the fat controller's coming back from his holidays. Perhaps he'll be able to sort something out. The fat controller's got a postcard from Marklin's old railway. Is he all right? He's doing better than all right. He's had an overhaul and everything. You wouldn't recognize him. I feel bad that we never got to know him properly. Do you think he'll be all right on his old railway? Of course he would. It's a big city port like no other. He'll be just fine. The Finn controller, Mr. Percival, was concerned for Duke. The former Mid-Sodor Railway's number one and the pride of the line was beginning to tire out. Duke had had every rebuild and overhaul given to him, but nothing had worked. It left Mr. Percival to make a very tough decision. I'm sorry, Duke, he said. I'm afraid we're going to have to send you to a mainland railway where they can take better care of you. It will mean, though, you will not be coming home to my railway. I understand, sir, said Duke with a wheeze. But I want you to know, Mr Percival added, you have made my railway proud. And I'm sure that Peter Sam and Sir Handel will wish you luck with your future. Duke felt very doubtful. The next morning, Henry arrived with a flat truck and crane to take Duke away. The little engines were sorry to see him go. They would never again have Grandpa work on their railway. As Mr Percival expected, Peter Sam and Sir Handel were hit hard with Duke's departure. They had worked with him on the Mid-Sodor, back when they were known as Stuart and Falcon. Peter Sam bustled into Clovens Gate Station, where a very smug-looking James waited for him. Oh, Grandpa popped off then? he asked. I'm not in the mood, huffed Peter Sam. Well, I can see you're a rain of sunshine today, chuckled James. How's Sir Handel getting on? Peter Sam gritted his teeth. Sir Handel was the last engine he wanted to think about. Now, it took a couple of days for Peter Sam to get over that Duke had gone, but Sir Handel was furious. Ever since Duke had left, Sir Handel had kicked up quite a storm. He refused to do his work, he argued with the bigger engines, particularly Gordon through past experiences, and even tried to give George the Steamroller a bit of lip from their last encounter. The other little engines even joked he was complaining more than Duncan, who didn't take kindly to the gesture. Eventually, Sir Handel was beginning to lose patience. He started to blame the Finn controller for sending Duke away, when he knew that many repairs could have been done. He decided to come up with one last scheme to try and get his way. But how exactly he was going to do it was going to be quite a shock. That afternoon, Sir Handel was taking sightseers to the green. Edward, who had brought Sir Handel's passengers to the station, had kept respectfully silent when the little engine had fussed away. As they headed towards the green, Sir Handel felt very clever. He had felt something rattle on the way up, 
and was determined to deliberately shake it loose. He had just climbed the hill when it happened. Let's see what the Fin Controller thinks of this now, he roared. Sir Handel jerked forward. The coaches wailed. Oh! They groaned. Sir Handel's jitter had done the trick. It had been his safety valve that had come loose, and the jolt was enough to cause it to go off. Sir Handel came to a stop just at the crest of the green. His crew were not happy. You silly engine, they scolded. We're going to have to get help now. The passengers, however, weren't too fussed. They climbed out of the coaches and explored the green. But they knew they'd have to have another engine to take them home. Before long, Scar Lowy and Rusty arrived. Scar Lowy took over the train, while Rusty took Sir Handel back to the yards. Mr. Percival was waiting for them. Thank you, Rusty. That'll be all, he said. Rusty quickly departed as Mr. Percival stared angrily at Sir Handel. Your behaviour these past few days has been inexcusable, the Finn controller rapped. I know you're upset that Duke is not here anymore, but you can't go around with a bad attitude. Sir Handel couldn't find the words to express himself, but he needn't bother. There's only one place I can send engines who don't do as they're told, said Mr Percival. I am sending you to the stone quarry. Perhaps your time there and only silly trucks for company will change your ways. I will not have rudeness and disrespect on my railway. And with that, Mr Percival turned sharply on his heel and walked away. Peter Sam was distraught when he'd learnt what happened to Sir Handel. But over time, the little engines almost forgot about him. They had their own adventures. Scar Lowy had conquered an old bridge. Reneus had delivered the skeleton of a dinosaur. Peter Sam had learnt of the story of Proteus and his magic lamp. Rusty had been caught up with a boulder. And Duncan had encountered a ghost on the old iron bridge. But the little engines knew that soon Sir Handel would come home and... But I mustn't tell you any more. But I think you all know what happened when Sir Handel did come home from the stone quarry. Duck the Great Western Engine felt like he had a spring in his step. It was all due to the recent visit of a very famous engine. The city of Truro wasn't just a celebrity in Duck's eyes. He was also a fellow Great Western Engine with the great honour of being the first engine to go a hundred miles an hour. Duck was very proud, but secretly he had been very shy to have talked to city of Truro when he first came to the island. But nevertheless, it didn't stop him from talking endlessly about the engine. The others took no notice. It wouldn't be long before Duck would later talk about the importance of the Great Western Way. But as time went on, Duck soon found himself feeling quite low. He did his work, but for some reason, he just couldn't find the energy to smile. Something was troubling Duck. He knew what it was, but he was worried the others would laugh at him. After all, he had been boasting about the city of Truro. But it also recently occurred to Duck that city of Truro was a fine engine, and he was just a tank engine. Duck knew there was one engine who could possibly help him. He was taking trucks over to Edwards Station anyway, so he hoped that the old blue engine would be there to solve his problems. When Duck brought his train to Edward's station, Edward was resting in a siding. Hello, Duck, said Edward. You look troubled. Do you think I'm just a tank engine from the Great Western Railway? asked Duck. Why ever would you think that, said Edward. Well... Ever since City of Truro's visit, I've been a bit low of myself. It was great seeing a fellow Great Western engine, but... 
I just don't feel like I could ever compare to him. Edward listened carefully. Seeing City of Truro reminded me of the Great Western Railway, replied Duck, especially when I used to run the Sunshine Line. But I suppose I'll never get that chance again. Before Edward could say anything else, Duck left his trucks and limped back to the Little Western. Poor fellow, sympathised Edward. He decided that it was time to talk to the Fat Controller. Sir, called Edward, perhaps I could have a word. Of course, Edward, said the Fat Controller. What can I do for you? Edward quickly explained about Duck. I see, said the Fat Controller when Edward had finished. Well, tell Duck not to worry, Edward, he said. I'll be making the arrangements straight away. And with that, the Fat Controller went to his office. Edward smiled. If there was one person who knew the problem of an engine, it was always the Fat Controller. It took a long time for the Fat Controller to make arrangements, but once everything was ready, he reassured Edward to keep Duck's spirits high until his surprise came. A few days later, the island of Sodor's peace and quiet was unexpectedly disturbed by a loud, shrill Great Western whistle. The famous city of Truro had returned after the Fat Controller and his owner had arranged for him to visit for a few days just for a certain Great Western tank engine. Hello, Duck, called City of Truro. Nice to see you again. Duck was speechless. Ba ba ba. How did, well, I, I don't under... How did... What? City of Truro chuckled. It was all down to your fat controller, he said. He told me that you were a bit under the weather, so I'm here to make sure that we turn that smile... So I'm here to make sure we turn that frown into a great western smile. Duck felt happier for the first time in weeks. City of Truro managed to stay for at least three days. Gordon respectfully kept his distance on the subject of domeless engines, but Duck didn't care. When City of Truro returned to the Great Western Railway, Duck promised that he would serve as a really useful engine on the Fat Controller's Railway. And even today, he would still do things the Great Western way.